If you're sufficiently um, courageous and forthright and honest, let's say, in your approach, and you don't shy away, what you'll find is that there's something within you that will respond to the challenge of suffering with the development of ability that will transcend the suffering. So the pessimism is, yeah, well, life is rife with problems every, at every level. But the upside is, if you turn and confront that voluntarily, that you'll find something in yourself that can develop and master that. And so the, the, the optimism is nested in the pessimism. And that's extremely helpful to people, especially people who are struggling because they think, oh my God, life is so difficult. I don't know if I can stand this. There must be something wrong with me. Does anybody else feel this way? And you can say, yes, everyone feels that way at some time. But that's, and, and, and it is as bad as you think, but you're more than you think you are. You're more than you think you are. And what I really like about this too is it's very much in keeping with the clinical data. So for example, what you do as a clinician, as a clinical psychologist, as a psychiatrist, um, as any mel mental health professional who's well-trained, is if, if people are afraid of something, afraid of something that's standing in their way as an obstacle, like maybe you're trying to develop your career and you're afraid of public speaking. Well, I could try to calm you down about your fear and, and protect you from the challenge that would be associated with public speaking. You say, well, you never have to do that. Or I could say, no, no, look, you have to learn to present yourself more effectively in public if you're going to develop your career. And you're afraid of it. So let's break down what you're afraid of in, into 10 steps or 20 steps until we can find a step that's small enough so that you can actually master it. Let's assume that with three years of diligent practice that you can become a competent public speaker, at least one that isn't terrified. And with five years, you can become an expert. And let's decide how relevant that is to your future prosperity and thriving. And then let's assume that if you break it down properly and take it on step by step in this incremental way that we discussed, that you'll actually master every single bit of it. And the thing that's cool about that is all the clinical evidence shows it works. And not only that, that's actually how you learn in life. Like when, you're, when, you're, when you bring a child to the playground and the child is apprehensive about making new friends, you say, okay, well, look, kiddo, and stick around me for a minute or two and just watch what's going on. It's like, and the child will calm down and say, okay, now go five feet away. Just go out there a little bit and just see how it goes and stay out there as long as you can. And if you need to come back for a hug, then no problem. It's like, so then the child can go out 10 feet. And they come back and say, okay, well now, you know, maybe just go over there and, and, and watch those kids. And the child will go out and then come back. And so that's it. It's their, the child's going out to where they're afraid, seeing that they can master it and then coming back. So I figured something out that I okay. thought I'd tell you about. This took me like 30 years to figure out, and I figured it out on this tour. So there's this old idea, you know, that you have to rescue your father from the belly of the whale, right? From some monster that's deep in the abyss. You see that in Pinocchio, for example, but it's a very common idea. And I figured out why that is, I think. So imagine that we already know from a clinical perspective that, you know, if you set out a path towards a goal, which want to do because you need a goal and you need a path because that provides you with positive emotion right so you, you set up something as valuable so that implies a hierarchy you set up something as valuable you decide that you're going to do that instead of other things so that's kind of a sacrifice because you're sacrificing everything else to pursue that and then you experience a fair bit of positive emotion and meaning as you watch yourself move towards the goal and so the implication of that is that the better the goal the the more full and rich your experience is going to be when you pursue it. So that's one of the reasons of, of that's one of the reasons for developing a vision and for fleshing yourself out philosophically because you want to aim at the highest goal that you can manage. Okay, so you do that, and then what you'll find is that as you move towards the goal, there are certain things that 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 you have to accomplish that frighten you. You know, maybe you have to learn to be a better speaker, a better writer, a better thinker. Or you have to be better to people around you, or you have to learn some new skills, and you're afraid of that. Whatever, because it's going to stretch you if you if you pursue a goal, and it's and so that'll put you up against challenges. Okay, so all the clinical data indicates well the opposite of safe spaces, as Jonathan Haidt has been pointing out. That what you want to do when you identify something that someone is avoiding that they need to do because they're afraid you have them voluntary, con voluntarily confront it. And so you break it down. What you try to do if you're a behavior therapist is you break down the thing they're avoiding into smaller and smaller pieces until you find a piece that's small enough so they'll do it. And it doesn't really matter as long as they start it 
you know, then they can put the next piece on and the next piece. And what happens is they don't get less afraid exactly. They get braver. They get, they get, it's like there's more of them. You can, and here's why. So imagine you do something new and that's informative, right? There's information in the action and then you can incorporate that information and turn it into a skill and turn it into a transformation of your perceptions. So there's more to you because you've tried something new. So that's one thing. The second thing is, and there's good biological evidence for this now, that if you put yourself in a new situation, then new genes code for new proteins and build new neural structures and new nervous system structures. Same thing happens to some degree when you work out, right? Because your, your muscles are responding to the load, but your nervous system does that too. So you imagine that there's a lot of potential you locked in your genetic code. And then if you put yourself in a new situation, then then the stress that's the situational stress that's produced by that particular situation unlocks those genes and then builds new parts of you. So that's very cool because who knows how much there is locked inside of you. Okay, so now here's the idea. So let's assume that that scales as you take on heavier and heavier loads. That more and more of you, you get more and more informed because you're doing more and more difficult things, but more and more of you gets unlocked. And so then what that would imply is that if you got to the point where you could look at the darkest things, so that would be the abyss, right? That would be the deepest abyss. If you could look at the harshest things, like the most brutal parts of the suffering of the world and the malevolence of people and society, if you could look that, look at that straight and, and directly, that that would turn you on maximally. And so that's the idea of rescuing your father, because imagine that you're like the potential composite of all your all the ancestral wisdom that's locked inside of you biologically but that's not going to come out at all unless you stress yourself unless you unless you challenge yourself and the bigger the challenge you take on the more that's going to turn on and so that as you take on a broader and broader range of challenges and you push yourself harder then more and more of what you could be turns on and that's equivalent to transforming yourself into the ancestral father into all because you're you're like the what would you call it you're the consequence of all these living beings that have come before you and that's all part of your biological potentiality and then if you can push yourself then all of that clicks on and that turns you into who you could be that's and that's the re-representation of that positive ancestral father so that's why you rescue your father from the belly of the beast Another thing i've often asked my undergraduate classes is you know, there's this idea that, that people have, that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is. It's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. You don't have to listen to it, strangely enough. But you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, uh, of course, exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happens, so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident. Because you, you know, I knew this was going to happen, I got a warning it was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. So you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for ten years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you could be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you in all your ability and your catastrophe. And that's a very, very difficult thing to negotiate. But if you do negotiate it, well, at least you, you have something, you have somewhere solid to stand and you have somewhere to live. You have a real life. And it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world, for example, because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death, which is what happens in a tremendous, a tremendously large minority of cases. Well, it's more than that, too, because, and this is what I'll close with, and this is why I wanted to introduce Solzhenitsyn's writings to you, you see, because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. 
And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way, and then it'll decline rapidly. But 7 billion people in the world, and who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do, but that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you, you'll know a thousand people at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each. And that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think.